All right, good morning, good morning. morning. How's everyone? Well, goodness gracious, um, thank you, Milby, for the um, excellent beginning. And I mean, the quote, some place to walk to and someone to walk with, I think that pretty much, I could just step off now and just go with that one. Um, So we're here to talk about some of the triumphs and some of the challenges um, and the bright road ahead, of course, for young adolescents and effective middle schools and OST out of school time. So just a, a brief introduction to where I come from, the, the context. Um, there we go. I'm going to do a little behind the back action. All right, so um, from AMLE, so the Association for Middle Level Education, this is where you can find us. Um, and also, I, I'm bringing up Twitter for a couple different reasons. One is because it is important to for all of us to stay connected in the virtual space as well as the face-to-face space. Um, So keep on doing that. And uh, I've been tweeting throughout the conference. So if you see me on my phone, I was up there doing it. I'm not being rude. I'm not checking my emails. I am tweeting. So um, please, I encourage you to tweet. It's not just about following the Kardashians, even though that's entertaining as well. Um, So you can email me at any time. And we have our own conference as well. Um, And in terms of the earthquake drill, um, I'd like to say we are here to Um, not only celebrate our understanding about after-school programs, but in some ways shake the very foundations uh, and question those. See how how we did that? There, it's very nice. All right. All right, so uh, AMLE, uh, actually AMLE has changed. We're formerly known as the National Middle School Association, uh, and we changed our name because of the very thing that we're talking about today, Um, that it's not just about middle schools but it's about middle level education. Anyone who works to, to, to improve the educational lives of students 10 to 15 years old. So wh- wh- wherever there is a conversation about young adolescents and helping them out, we want to be a part of that conversation. So I want to thank Youth Next. I also want to thank uh, you know, Milbury and Karen for uh, just feel very honored to be a part of this conversation. And thank you everybody out there for everything that you will continue to contribute to today's um, festivities and learning. Um, and Nancy uh, did give you a little bit of uh, information about me, uh, and this is just everyone has their context. Um, mine is not Cabrini, uh, green-like, but it's uh, just a little path here. So uh, this is who I was, um, middle school and elementary school principal and assistant principal, middle school teacher, um, high school teacher, as Nancy said right there at Harrisonburg, Virginia, the number two poultry capital in the world, I think still, correct? Yeah? I don't know if it's made up to number one, but we're getting there, right? Um, and, and this is, and to also echo what Nancy said earlier, um, middle school student, all right? So ra- uh, raise your hand if you were a uh, young adolescent at some time. Yeah? All right. That is key. A lot of R's get tossed around with education, correct? Remembrance is one that is key. With the success of a school, a classroom, or an after-school program, remembering what you were like between the ages of 10 to 15 years old is essential. Think about the decisions you made as a child. Think about the cares and concerns you had as a young adolescent. Think about the fashion choices that you tried to make. Think about the connections and the relationships that you wanted and the support that you needed. And did you get that kind of support? What kind of after-school programs did you participate in? What were those that kept you buoyed and kept you afloat in the uh, tumultuous waters of young adolescents? So think about that as we continue on. Um, One of the handouts that's available out there on the table is uh, this characteristics of young adolescents. And I encourage you to pick it up, not only for your own self, but for anyone else who is you know, just new to young adolescents, or maybe you've got a sixth grade daughter and, uh, and you need to know, hey, what, 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 who is this child? I don't recognize this child anymore, okay? This is 40 years of research talking to you about young adolescents, okay? So uh, we bring this up because typically when I talk to, to schools and to teachers about achievement, people talk about, oh, well, we measure that through test scores, through data, through state standardized testing, through grades, et cetera, et cetera. But what sometimes gets forgotten about young adolescents is they are trying to achieve in all of these areas. It's not just about cognitive and intellectual. And after-school programs are key to helping them achieve in, those different, in the, all those different ways. So like any good assessment, we're going to start with a true and false quiz before we get into what school and after-school programs um, can do. All right? So here we go. <clears throat> and you, can, um, you have to chime in now. All right? So middle school students are, A, easy to categorize on a list. True or false? False. All right, that's very true. Okay, so we're going to start this list with that, you know, um, little falsehood there. Yes, you cannot categorize young adolescents with a broad stroke. Okay, they're all very different. With that in mind, though, all right, they are achieving in multiple areas. True or false? True. Okay, I just told you that one, so you get get that one. Okay, 
Okay? They're in need of materials for growth. That is true. They are seeking guidance as they build. That is true. They are looking for consistency. That is true. Yes, there's a myth conception about middle school and young adolescents being kind of a wild, wild west. Oh, these kids are just crazy. They don't know what they're doing. They like routine. They like consistency, and they need it from us. Okay? And they're always under construction. True or false? Right. So they're going to build. They're going to build. So the positive youth development, PYD, is essential. I've tried to go to the negative youth development conference. It's a completely different conversation. Okay? <laughs> So I applaud you for going in the positive direction. Um, so we have to give them the materials, the consistency, and the guidance through our after-school programs that they're going to need. They're going to construct themselves. Who is going to give them the direction? They're going to get it from somewhere. All right, so after-school programs, um, I'm going to use a little metaphorical journey here, but this is what they can do and how they help with young adolescents. It's a merge sign. Okay, so after-school programs provide help with the mer young adolescents is about the merging of a lot of different things coming together in young adolescents' life. Okay, it's a, it's a time of great change, and it's a it's a time of coming together of factors and influences. Okay, peers and adults. That's a coming together. Okay, how do you wage those two together? Social emotional learning and academic learning. How do you bring those two together? So, after school programs can be that stable sign point in the road to say, listen, it's all right, and we're going to be here every time you come. All right. It's also the coming together of many different hands, all right, to make this work happen. And of course, it needs a mutually, a mutually cultivated soil and an enriched soil. And we also have to be prepared with, with our after-school programs. You never know when that seed is going to germinate and blossom forth from the soil. Okay, I taught kids, gosh, at Harrisonburg High School back in 1994, and I had one come to me 10 years later and said, thank you, Mr. Tomlin, for teaching me English language arts in ninth grade basic English at Harrisonburg High School. And I said, well, gosh, I wish you would have told me that the year that I taught you. But see, you never know. So with our programs, we have to be aware that those kids are going to benefit from what we're doing. We might not see the germination uh, right now, okay? Uh, in terms of birds, um, that it is a stable place to perch. It is a stable place to come. And like Emily Dickinson said, hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul. So our after-school programs can help that hope spring forth and fly out. We want our kids to soar, and I mean S-O-A-R, not S-O-R-E in our programs. All right? Um, of course, they have to be flexible and diverse. Okay, so that's why the rubber bands are there. They need to be flexible. We need to have a framework, though. That's why there's that frame around it. There has to be a framework within, or to build that flexibility within. So kids have a voice and a choice uh, in that program. And last but not least... Um, some students see themselves as minor characters in the story of school. Minor characters in the story of school. So an after-school program can provide a new lens through which to see themselves. So they can see themselves as major characters in the story of school. All right, so that's what an after-school program can do. So I applaud everyone for being here to make this kind of thing happen. Okay, so what can we do to make it all work? So... Another handout that's out there are the 16 characteristics of an effective middle school. So once again, AMLE and its research, we've shown that there are 16 characteristics. The little graphic looks like something like this. Ta-da. All right. Um, and this, it will, we're going to look at this, use this document to kind of frame the conversation going forward. So the first one being curriculum, instruction, and assessment. These are five characteristics underneath that particular umbrella. And the one that shouts out to me from the rooftops is that first one. And I love that it starts with this one is that educators value young adolescents and are prepared to teach them. That's what we need in our schools and in our after-school programs. That's the number one qualification. You can have the content, you can have the rigor, you can have everything else, but if you don't understand who you serve, you're missing the point of your program. So, and that key word being value, value, what does that mean? It doesn't just mean that you understand their characteristics, but it means you understand what the children can not only get from your program, but what they can give back. That's where our youth are the most powerful engines that we know, but we've got to utilize them. Okay, so what are their gifts, what are their talents, and what can they give back? All right, so with that and with all these characteristics here and the ongoing assessments piece is a big one too, um, what are some actions that schools can take. Now, I like the little disappearing boxes, so you have to deal with that. Okay, so I'm like, the, hide the content and then reveal. It's like a game show. All right, so 
You have to have a clear understanding of who's being served. The key of this is relationships between students. That's the foundation, relationships. Okay, that's key. You also need environments that are structured, routine, and supportive. All right, I'll get into some specific examples in a little bit. You need effective, consistent, and fair behavioral guidelines for students. Those behavioral guidelines for your program that align to a school. So if you're working with a school program, those behavioral guidelines need to be in place. So the staff knows that your folks in the after school program are working with kids in an effective way, behaviorally too. Engaging in joyous, differentiated instruction and activities. All right. Uh, asking for and giving, and watch out how you finish that one. That's help. Okay. Help. Okay. Um, that there is a sense of uh, risk taking, purposeful risk taking in an after school program or a school is awesome. We want to. to show our students that it's okay to make mistakes because that's where learning becomes a great thing. It's not a stumbling block, but it's a stepping stone, as they say. So what can we do in our programs to show that it's okay to ask for and give help? It's okay to be vulnerable. And then communicating with parents and guardians and the use of assessments to adjust effectiveness. And just a little point of clarity, we always want to be effective. We're not adjusting to, not, to no longer be effective. We're, adju we're adjusting to make sure that we're being effective. So the triumphs and challenges, just a, a little example. Um, when I was a, a school administrator, I had a lot of students who had disciplinary infractions, and part of my job was to write up office referrals. Isn't that a joyous day-to-day -day responsibility? Um, and we had, and we had a, a 1,400 kids in our school, and I was in charge of 450 eighth graders. And all the administrator said, you know, we have some what we called frequent flyers. Now, we realized that the ink and the paper was not serving them because they'd come on back. So clearly, it was not really an educational experience. So what we realized was we needed to have a different program. And if you think about RTI, response to intervention, we needed to have another tier for certain at-risk students. So we developed a program called Pathway. Now, it's an acronym. It's a long one. I don't remember what it means. But uh, it put them on a positive pathway. And what we did was we connected with our local YMCA. And we said, you know what? We need some help. Um, we need to have a mutual vision uh, about how we're going to serve these young adolescents, these at-risk students at our school. Um, we were clear with them about who we were sending. We said, this is, this is how they were selected, and this is who we're sending your way. We're going to work together with you. And they were clear with us about who their leaders were and who their faculty was who were going to be serving our students. Um, their environment was structured and controlled while also giving freedom. So we brought the kids over there on a bus in after school, and they worked on team building. They did ropes courses uh, outside, inside. They had conversations about youth leadership, and it was a wonderful, excellent, and empowering experience. Um, and, of course, we had frequent check-ins and communication because that was clear. On the flip side of that, one of my responsibilities now is to go around the country and help out schools um, in any way that they need help. And there was a, a program in a state that will go unnamed, um, but they had an ELT program. Okay, so extra learning time or extended learning time was what that program was. And it was the complete opposite. Um, that there, it was a program that was put upon the end of the school day. And it was clear from just my time, my three days at that school, that it was not driven by leadership. There was no communication. Teachers felt very disempowered and actually resented the program because the schedule was not clear. And uh, it actually did a disservice to their te teaming and planning. So there are triumphs and there are challenges. But the, the main thing is that coordination and communication is key. All right, so rolling right along. For leadership and organization, um, the key one, again, that, that shouts out at me is a shared vision, that it has to be a shared vision between the school and the after-school program of why are we doing this? What's our vision and mission? It has, if, this, if this is so important, we need to be able to tell people very clearly why we're doing it. Okay, so that's key. A co-developed between after-school program and school, a, school a, a vision and responsibility. All right, so what can we do? Aha, the disappearing boxes. Ta-da. All right, so a clear understanding of vision, mission, and strategic plan goals of both parties, both school. What, hey, what's the school's vision and mission? And then what's the after school's vision and mission? And where is their alignment? And where do we need to have a sweet spot? What's that secret sauce that we're going to put to make sure that kids are being served? 
We need to make sure that leadership is visible and accessible. And that means walking around. That means checking things out. That means acting within the program. And oh yes, smiling on occasion. All right? Not just walking around with a clipboard and, you know, inspecting what you expect, but sharing in the joy in your program. All right? We also need leaders who plan and create and construct collaboratively. All right? We need clear and effective a schedule that's maintained. Yes, there needs to be... Now, that's also maintained, monitored, and malleable. All right? So there needs to be a set beginning and end time. Or if you don't, that's just going to drive, you know, teachers and program providers and parents a little uh, goofy. Um, but within that framework, you have some flexibility within that structure. Um, safety and behavioral policies are transparent, maintained, and followed. Um, leaders observe and respond to their teachers and staff. That frequent response of, how am I doing as a care provider? How am I doing in my after-school program working with young adolescents? If you don't get that feedback, then you're really, you don't know how you're doing. Okay, so leaders have to provide that. And then, of course, with that is professional learning. Through your observations of your after-school program and those providers, you then learn what folks need in terms of their professional learning and development. Okay? So, that's very essential. Organizational structures that are communicating, and the communication channels are clear. What I mean by that is that if somebody has an issue at the after-school program, they know who to turn to in a clear and inviting way. You have an open-door policy, and there's no screen on that door. Everybody's invited. Okay? Um, and leadership is cultivated and celebrated. So that's how that goes. All right? And I'm kind of have to move real fast now. Okay. So after-school programs affect the culture and community of a school. Uh, and it has to be inviting. Of course, the purpose is inviting, safe, inclusive, and supportive of all. That's the point of it all. And they help accomplish all these critical elements. Inclusion, safety, advocacy, guidance, support, health and wellness, and family and community involvement. But how do we make that happen? All right, so once again, oh, disappearing boxes. I know you love them. All right. Students need to have a voice and a choice within the structured environment. Absolutely. Young adolescents crave it. Now, does that mean you give them the reins completely? No. But you need to give them some choice and voice within that structured framework. A student, every student has an adult advocate, and that means every person in the program must be and must see themselves as accessible to a young adolescent and using the objects on either side of their head. That's the way you engage with the young adolescent. These, your ears. Just listen. That's where you start. A tiered system of support, so just like RTI. Some students in your program are going to need more support than others, so how are you going to supply that and how are you going to communicate that? Frequent opportunities for recognition and celebration. Don't wait for the great milestones because for a young adolescent, a mile is a long way away. You need to have smaller, more frequent recognition. So not milestones, but instead yard stones or foot stones, you know, smaller increments uh, to measure their, and celebrate their success. Responsive and ready guidance services that are supported by everybody. Not a guidance counselor, per se, in your after-school program, but that everybody sees themselves as somebody who can provide some guidance. Now, of course, if you come across a real sticky situation that needs a professional, like a school social worker or a guidance counselor, then by all means, go, go see those people. But everybody's involved. Awareness of student health and wellness choices and social relationships. That doesn't mean that an after-school provider or a school per, or a teacher can, needs to be the sole solution provider. They just need to have an awareness and then communicate what that is. All right? Uh, opportunities for family engagement. And community and business partners are involved as well. So there are triumphs and challenges um, that we face with after-school programs and school coordination, but it can happen. The keys that I have seen and that AMLE recognize, it's about coordination, it's about communication, it's about alignment of the shared vision and monitoring it throughout its scope and sequence as you deliver and serve um, those students. So. Thank you. Uh, that, that's my time. Thank you so much for your kind participation and kind attention. And um, there you go.